welcome people to this new edition of our Enos Insights podcast. As usual, my name is Roy Kanadag and I have the pleasure today to introduce uh, to you none other than May Derwish. Hi, May. Hi, Roy. Thank you for being here. Um, and maybe to tell you a bit about who May is, May is Associate Professor in International Relations of the Middle East at Birmingham University in the UK. Before that, she was at Durham University, and even before that, she was for, for two years at, at Giga, that's the German Institute of Global and Area Studies, right next to Bremen in Hamburg. And um, at that time, she was doing her PhD, which she finished in international relations at Edinburgh University in 2015. She is researching and teaching the international relations of the Middle East regarding her research. She has just finished a three-year project on port infrastructures from the Arabian Gulf to the Horn of Africa. There are many recommendable publications um, on her list. I would like to refer you to her 2019 monograph, Threats and Alliances in the Middle East, which was published at Cambridge University Press. And among the many other articles and chapters and also academic interventions out, out there, we have this most recent article in the Middle East policy called Forward to the Past, Regional Repercussions of the Gaza War, which was co-authored with Martin Walbjörn from Aarhus University and Anri Bank from Giga Hamburg. May, um, maybe you could briefly start explaining why, um, why you thought writing about the these these specific regional dimensions of the Gaza war and what it was that that you found out with this perspective. Yeah, thank you, Roy, for having me and for the invitation. It's a pleasure to be talking um, to you today about this topic. Um, so the Gaza war has been uh, more or less like what we call a critical juncture, which is a very important event that kind of changed some of the dynamics of the phenomenon that we have in international relations. And these critical junctures could be wars, conflicts, it could be even sometimes natural disasters that come and change the patterns of interactions between actors. And therefore, the Gaza war is such an incident that was significant in the Arab region, but also in the Middle East, but also worldwide in some aspect that it changed some of the dynamics and the interactions between regional actors, international actors. It also brought some new ideas, new conception, conceptions to the world system, to the world order that we live in. And therefore, we were kind of very keen to reflect on those regional dynamics. But also there has been very much focus on the Palestinian-Israeli dynamic of the war. So most of the people who have been studying the, like the war recently, or they've been just analyzing it, they've been very much focused on either the details of the everyday dynamics of the war or contextualizing in the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And very few have tried to look at it from the regional perspective. So we were very much interested to look at the war from that perspective and also offer some insights, how we can understand how the region affected the development of the conflict, but also how the conflict itself has an impact on regional dynamics. Mm. I mean, from everyday observation and media coverage, and also looking at the political dynamics of this region. So there seems to be this weird coexistence between, on the one hand, an enormous emotional connection and an enormous resurgence of the Palestinian issue in, in the domestic politics of all the major actors involved in, in, in this region. But on the other hand, like not so much change. I mean, it seems to be whatever that solidarity is, nothing really, nothing really changed with this regard. How did you? Um, yeah, I, I think for me and my co-authors, we we kind of actually started with that kind of observation that we find most of the observant scholars, but also sort of normal general audience, 
often try to make very strong statements about what changed and what didn't change. And there's always this kind of divide and there's this polarization between some people and say, well, this changes everything. And the other kind of can, they say, well, nothing changed. It's always the same. It's going to be more or less the same. So we looked back at Fred Halliday's work, especially when he studied the 9-11 period and its impact on international relations. And he made, he made this very important statement that somewhat all critical junctures, all important events, people tend to be divided around those who believe that this changes everything and those who believe this, that it doesn't change anything. But he thought that there is always continuity and change in every event. There are elements that come from the past, and there are also new elements which are introduced by this event. And we kind of embraced the attitude in our research and tried to be objective, trying to trace what are the elements of continuity and what are the elements of change when we look at the Gaza war. Because on the one hand, we can see that the Gaza war is not a unique event in the history of the conflict, as might some people think that, oh, this has never happened before. Actually, many of its elements happened in previous episodes of the conflict, but also that particular event is introducing some new dynamics that we have to take into account when we look at that particular incident. Now, when you do that, I... I like this notion that you, for the purpose of this article, you explain what happens from a regional dimension. But a regional dimension means you have to be aware of so many, you know, different positions of each of these regional players. And on the hand, other hand, also of like dynamics that determine most of these countries involved or so. And when you do that, you, so I like the notion of that you explain that so in regularized Middle East and Arab politics, Palestine was always big on the agenda. Doesn't mean that pro-Palestine politics always came through with it, but it was high on the agenda and everybody had to, had to be aware of that. And, now, and then with the Arab uprisings from Tunisia 2010-11 and then Egypt or so, there is a downside, downside of, of the presence of Palestine in this region. And it read rather curiously for me. So, how was it even possible uh, to have Palestine, I mean, not erased, but, I don't know, diminished in its regional importance, mostly because many of the protest movements also very much connected with uh, Palestinian issues? Yeah, I, th I think in our paper, but also in, in the conversations that me and my co-authors had, it was always, um, on the one hand, we had this issue that Palestine was definitely absent, at least from the formal and official agendas of the actors in the region. But at the very same time, because we don't see it, it doesn't mean that it was absent. It simply means that we were not looking in the right place. So throughout the Arab uprisings after 2011, many of the Arab states either fell into authoritarian backlash or civil wars or simple domestic conflict over power. We have the cases of Syria, of Yemen, of Sudan, Egypt, Tunisia. And in most of these situations, the domestic factors were simply overwhelming for many of the Arab states. So they kind of refocused their shift from regional issues to domestic issues. And that's kind of expected in these kind of moments. But also the Syria war was a huge event in the region that took all the attention, but it also drew the polarization and the alliances of many of these regional actors. And we've seen during that period that there was this divide between Saudi Arabia and Iran and their competition and rivalry in Iraq, in Syria, in Lebanon, um, and in Yemen toward the end. But 
somewhat the core issue, which was the Arab-Israeli conflict that kind of was driving Arab politics from 1948 until the 2000, was no longer the major problem of the region, simply because leaders now have more important problems, which are to survive in this kind of decade how to survive this popular upset, how to survive civil wars, how to survive violence, um, and also how to dominate mm. and how to impose their agendas. So during that time, simply there was no focus. The media focus was turned away completely from Palestine. Leaders focus, they were not just debating Palestine and how to frame an agenda around the Palestinian issue. They had other issues. And even then, during that decade, it's important not to forget that there were several incidents of violence, like the Gaza War of 2014, 2019, 2021, 2022. There were also several incidents in the West Bank of violence, like the Sheikh Jarrah event in 2021. And it's very important to see that even though at that official level, we couldn't really see Palestine. It doesn't mean that it was absent. It was always there, mm. and especially at the popular level. So people in the region simply didn't give up on Palestine. So if you talk to a normal person in the Arab world, they would tell you what was happening in the West Bank the last three, four years, which might not be the case if you talk to a person in Europe mm. about what was happening in the West Bank. Their first hand experience with what was happening in the West Bank is probably 2023. And that was it. But in the Arab world, that wasn't the case. So when we talk about how this revitalization of pan-Arab solidarity around Palestine, that is definitely something that is a little bit changing now, but it wasn't completely absent after 2011. And that's why I'm saying that even though Palestine was absent, it doesn't mean that it was 100% absent. It was simply that we were not looking. And that makes somehow the bias of the researcher, the bias of the media, somewhat um, very influential here in our perception of what is important and what's not important. But also many of the observers and the scholars who were focusing on the Palestinian-Israeli conflict, they all warned against something is going to explode at some point because the situation was very, very fragile mm. the last three, four years. And many have made several statements about this, but it was simply not given enough attention. Mm. So that's why we call it this like the apparent absence of Palestine. So, and then with the Hamas attacks of 7th of October and the, uh, and the war that is going into its 11th month now, so what changes now would you say for regional politics with this then more obvious mm -hmm. drastic return of Palestine to the agenda? Yeah, I think I think there are several elements. Again, we tried to look at the elements of continuity and the elements of change, and we tried to trace that along four sort of elements or four pillars that we're looking at. So the first one was mainly about the scope of the popular mobilization around the Palestinian issue. So before 2011, there was constant popular solidarity in the Arab world with the Palestinian issue. It was considered part of the pan-Arab identity. And even though pan-Arabism declined at the official level in the sense that Arab states have no longer this political project of uniting under one Arab state, um, the identity and the cultural aspect of pan-Arabism is still very present in the Arab world. And this cultural aspect is very tied to the idea of the support to Palestine. Um, and it's been there all along. So even though Arab regimes gave up on the pan-Arab agenda officially, they couldn't really go against their people in many of the instances. Every war happened during the decades, like when we talk about the 2006 Lebanon War, the 2009 Gaza war in particular, 
there was huge popular mobilization in the Arab world to support the Palestinian resistance or the Lebanese resistance against Israel. So in a way, nowadays we see this kind of return. We see this kind of cultural, societal pan-Arabism around the resistance against Israel and the support to the Palestinian cause. But what is new is that it's not just related to the Arab world. We've seen this global solidarity emerging, protests going everywhere in the world, supporting Palestine, asking for ceasefire, pressuring governments to take different stances on the Palestinian issue. So before 2011 or before the 7th of October and the current war, Palestine was merely an Arab issue. And the popular mobilization was mainly around Arab issues, with the exception of some leftist movements in Europe or in Latin America that were very much supportive and vocal about Palestine, but they were still niche. Nowadays, we see this global solidarity. So we see a solidarity that's coming mainly from global South countries. And it's not just related to Palestine. They started linking Palestine to issues against imperialism, issues against colonialism, but also it seems like the Palestinian issue have triggered memories and grievances all over the world. That wasn't the case before. So now we see this new dynamic in this conflict that we have not really experienced in previous episodes. The second pillar that we kind of traced was the discourses deployed at the popular and the regime level around the war. And again, where these Arab solidarity at the popular level, now we can see this much more prominent through social media. We didn't have social media before, but now with the social media, we see popular expressions of pan-Arabism, popular expressions to support Palestine, but also to draw, like, to draw connections mm. how Arab people are all standing against Israel. And these kind of solidarities are becoming much more vocal in different mediums, like on Facebook, on X, Twitter, on um, Instagram, and it's really taking over. What is actually a little bit new on that front that we actually see that most of the people now around the world, they start getting their news from these social media, from these discourses. They're not relying anymore on international media outlets, but they're rather following the people on the ground. They're following what's happening on social media. So we have a new public sphere that's emerging that wasn't there. It was there before, but it took different forms. And also we've seen in many countries where protests were not allowed, like in Egypt or um, in Algeria, um, we've seen huge boycott movements. And that again, that was present before, like during the first and the second intifada, that was adopted, but somewhat after 2023, it's taking a whole different scale and a whole different meaning. And it's just taking a different form than what we've seen in previous episodes. But at the same time, when we look at the regimes, now the regimes are also very different in how they approach or how they talk about the Palestinian issue. Most of the regimes in the Arab world are either suppressing expressions of support to the Palestinian issue, or they're trying to channel it for their own domestic purposes, like Tunisia, for example, in this kind of authoritarian um, backlash, Kais Said allowed the protests for his own political gain. Last week in Algeria, the elections, we've seen much of the discourses more or less adopting stances to support the Palestinian issue in order to draw domestic support. So the regimes have also taken different issues. But more importantly than this, that we've seen 
many of the Arab regimes actually standing against the Palestinian issue and their support of Israel, like the positions of the UAE, um, persecution of their own people if they realize that they're actually going too far in criticizing them for not supporting Palestine. So in a way, we are seeing a whole different dynamic of regime that were somewhat unthinkable before. Like a few weeks ago, we've seen the numbers about the largest number of exports that arrived in Israel from Arab countries. Mm -hmm. And the four countries that basically helped Israel survive are Egypt, Morocco, Jordan, and the UAE. Something like this would have been completely unthinkable to even mention decades ago or in the pre-2011 era. So we're seeing again a whole new discourse as well from the regime level. The third pillar that we're, talked about, we're talking about is the regional alliance structure. So the war has somewhat changed how actors position themselves. Not necessarily changed, but it made some positions stronger and it made some alliances actually fade away. And that is interesting. So one of the elements of the continuity that we're seeing through this war is the axis of resistance that emerged after the Iraq war of an alliance between Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas. And this axis has more or less shaped the politics of the region throughout the two decades after the Iraq war until 2020-21. But somewhat Hamas, after 2011, distant itself from the axis of resistance, especially after the crackdown of the Syrian regime on the protesters. We've seen now that this alliance has been cemented again, but it's been also joined by other actors like the Houthis in Yemen, which have played a very important role during the war. So we've seen that the axis has somewhat been revitalized and it's been given new meaning, a new purpose in regional politics. On the other hand, we see also that some actors which were extremely active against Israel are becoming completely silent, like Syria. Mm -hmm. So Syria has been attacked so many times by Israel, and it's been bombed several times. No reaction whatsoever, no statement whatsoever. And this is also related to how Syria came about after the 10 years following the uprising, weakened, but also very keen to return to the Arab fold. So the deals with the Arab regimes is to actually not stand on this issue. So Syria has been trying more or less to please the Arab regimes, not take a strong action and still maintain the alliance with Iran. Another new development is that the moderate camp that existed against this axis, which was composed of Saudi Arabia, Jordan, and Egypt, we see that this camp is not really coherent anymore. Those actors are not really acting in tandem the way they were doing that before 2011, but rather every actor have their own agenda. And it seems now that the region has no hegemon. There is no, the polarization that we've seen, it's not really polarization, but we call it a multiplexity because it seems very diverse ideologically, but also very diverse in capabilities and in also in what actors would like to achieve and in their agendas. So we don't really see that structure anymore, but it's rather a more fluid situation where actors are still trying to find what is going to happen. This is also made more uncertain by the withdrawal of the U.S. from regional politics during the Obama administration onward. But also, it's very unclear who's going to win the war, what's going to happen after the war, how the U.S. is going to reframe and reconfigure its role in the Middle East, especially that it's very clear now that the U.S. has been returning to the Middle East despite its will. <laughs> mm. So it seems now that things are changing. 
Turkey is becoming more involved and kind of changing its positions. Qatar as well has evolved as a critical actor, an important mediator with different relationships. So in a way, this kind of fluid situation, we see this multiplexity and the previous alliances that we've seen before 2011 are definitely changing mm. because of the war. One major aspect of that new Arab Cold War that Andre mm -hmm. Bank and Morten Bergman write about in in 2008-2009 was that interestingly back then Arab politics or the more ideological part of Arab politics was taken over by the non-Arab states like Iran and Turkey or so. So back then Iran and Turkey could much more play the Palestinian card or so and to the shadow of the Arab states who could not do that because of their own legitimacy issues or so. Is this also changed now because of this alliance? Yeah, it's it's definitely the same dynamic in the sense that non-Arab states are still playing an actor, but it's not a Cold War anymore in the sense that we don't have two clear camps. Mm -hmm. So during 2009, 2006, there were two very clear camps, the axis of resistance and the moderate camp. Nowadays, we don't have that clear division and we don't have coherent moderate camp. We have an axis of resistance that's definitely now being revitalized. New actors join like the Houthis in Yemen, um, but also other militias in Iraq have been very active in this war, attacking US military bases. And it seems now that this kind of axis is kind of gaining a new dimension. But at the same time, the moderate camps are not just worried about their own legitimacy against their people, they're actually going much further in their cooperation and in their dependence on the US. And now we also see other actors who were not active in that period of the 2006-2009, like the UAE, for example. And the UAE, again, the UAE, it has its own agenda even though it's not supporting the Palestinian issue, but it has its own agenda in the war. And somewhat this coherent agenda that existed and that what was created the new Cold War, we don't have such a coherent agenda between Egypt, Jordan, Saudi Arabia, the UAE. Mm -hmm. It's now much more diverse than it used to be. And everyone, they have their own problems. Egypt now, and its huge economic crisis has more or less changed its relationship with Saudi Arabia and it's changed its relationship with many of the Gulf countries, but also with the US. So we and see here, Turkey. The, yeah, so and Turkey, exactly. Yes. Just yesterday, that visit is definitely a historical one. It's been over since 2014, this is the first visit of Sisi to Turkey. So we can see here that the agenda is very fluid. The positions are very fluid. They are not as committed to that Cold War that existed in 2006. Also, if I remember correctly, one other dimension of that article back then, but also of the regional politics back then, was that it was still the high time of a strong Arab Islamist opposition in most of these in most of these autocratic Arab regimes. And I assume the threat of this is uh, is over now, now that I don't know many states like Egypt and others have demonstrated how you can crack down on even very important Islamist opposition movements like the Muslim Brothers or so. So with them not so much on the agenda anymore, does that give the regime's more leeway, would you say, or is it also a bit more anarchic in their countries in the sense that now every strong pro-Palestine emotion could be triggered into uncontrollable mm -hmm. protests? Yeah, well, I, I think that's definitely a, a very important aspect. And that's actually our fourth pillar that we talked about in the paper. And we talked about this regime people divide. Mm. So, and that is, a huge continuity. This divide between the people and the regime has been all along, and it's been one of the main causes and factors that have triggered the Arab uprisings in the first place. 
So in a way, in the pre-2011, definitely for sure, Egypt, along other countries, they had a very strong opposition, not strong, but at least organized opposition in the Brotherhood movement. After 2013 and the crackdown on the Brotherhood, we can see that the Brotherhood are nearly absent from debates on Palestine. They're nearly absent from um, politics, from opposition, from organizing opposition against the regimes. So in a way, we can say that the regime has been relatively successful in controlling that opposition or cracking down on opposition. Nevertheless, in during that war, there have been two issues. The first issue that we see a continuing use of the Brotherhood as the main threat in Egypt. So every time that there is some sort of a criticism to the regime because of any action or non-action in Gaza, the regime responds that this is a brotherhood conspiracy to draw Egypt into a conflict. And that has been used very prominently on social media in elite discourses. So in a way, the regime kind of got hold of the brotherhood and they can control it, but nevertheless, they're still making use of it to actually justify some of the policies that they are making on Gaza. And also justifying some of the decisions of why not supporting Hamas or why Hamas should be eradicated. And somewhat this kind of discourse found relevance in Egypt after 2013. But somewhat nowadays, it's not finding any resonance. Mm -hmm. And that is the major problem, that there is a huge disconnect, again, between people and regime, a very similar situation to what was before 2011. And if someone is interested to go back to the protest of 2011, some of the videos of the banners that were used in the Tahrir Square, many of the banners actually cited Gaza and the Gaza War of 2009 as one of the main reasons of frustration against the Mubarak regime. And we can see nowadays that the same regime people divide still exist in Egypt, but also in the rest of the Arab world, that somehow this divide is increasing. It's not going to go away, even though there is coercion and repression to suppress some of the expressions of solidarity uh, for Palestine to repress some of these emotional sort of expressions for the Arab cause for, um, let's say, uh, asking the government to intervene or expressing simply opposition to what the Egyptian government is doing is dealt with with extreme violence. So many incidents where people would just post a video on Instagram or Facebook saying, just expressing emotional, not even criticizing, mm. just emotional expression of how they feel about Palestine or what's happening in Gaza, following day, they're just arrested. And this has happened over and over and over again. The Palestinian flag has been banned in the public spaces in Egypt to that extent. That is something that's entirely new because mm. before Arab regimes would use Palestine to actually draw popular support as well. So now this popular support for Palestine is becoming a threat because it's simply amplifying this regime people divide. So whether this is going to cause unrest towards these authoritarian regime, whether it's going to cause them a headache, it's very hard to predict. Mm. But it's definitely a huge gap. And just enough to, to see this gap, like some of the surveys of the public opinion in the Arab world that have been conducted um, in many of the Arab countries, like the last few months, they're all going in the same direction. More than 90 people support Palestine. More than 90 people are against any acts of normalization or economic relations with Israel. 
more than I don't know how much mm. they are for an Arab action to stop the war. So when we put these numbers and these figures and then we compare them to how the governments are acting, we see the huge gaps. We see the huge problem that these regimes are also facing. They're not really responding to any of the popular demands, mm -hmm. uh, let alone many of the countries that have normalization agreements, including the Abraham Accords, have been going out in protest, like in Morocco or in Egypt or in Jordan, asking to cancel mm -hmm. those normalization agreement and is there any kind of response from the government no response whatsoever so it's all clear here that we have even though israel is surviving through violence even though these regimes are surviving through violence it's never going to bring stability it's never going to bring peace because the people are not really in compliance with any of what's happening mm. politically. And that is the crux of what we think is the problem, because if we're talking about peace, if we're talking about stability in the Middle East, we need to take into account what the people in the region actually feel, what they want, what they request, their needs. And as long as we have this kind of disconnect, stability is not really going to be either in the Arab-Israeli conflict or in domestic politics in many of these Arab regimes. Okay, wow. So, uh, uh, multiplexity, more fluid relations and alliances between, between these countries, which are not as polarized and easily observable as in the 2000s, in the aftermath of the Iraq war back then, uh, which means, yeah, we, we need studies like the ones you just conducted, so um, concrete analyses of, of that, that managed to grasp the, the complexity of this, which could be just a moment right now, and that moment could be, could be over in one year or in two, three years or so, and then we have a totally different alliance structure there. So um, not only because of that, thank you very much, May, for, for the article uh, that you wrote with, with Andrea. Thank you for having me, Roy. Thank you very much. But also for being here with us and explaining this for, uh, to us in, in more detail. Thank you so much and, and all the best. No problem.